The final item of business today is a member's business debate on motion number 113 in the name of Ian Gray on the closure of the Royal Bank of Scotland Preston Pans branch. This debate will be concluded without any questions being put. May I ask those members who wish to speak in the debate to please press the request to speak buttons now. I call on Ian Gray to open the debate and you have seven minutes, Mr Gray. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Presiding Officer. Um, and, uh, I uh, have to confess that uh, in my time as a, an MSP, this is not the first time uh, that a bank has closed a branch in one of the communities uh, that I represent. But it is the first time uh, that I have brought that closure to Parliament uh, in the form of a motion uh, and by debate. Uh, and the reason for that is very straightforward. The RBS branch in Preston Pans uh, is the last branch. Uh, when it closes, and the closure is planned for August, there will be no banks uh, in the town of Preston Pans. So this rather brings home a, a truth which we sometimes, I think, in here forget, which is that Scotland is not a country of half a dozen cities, uh, but much more a country of hundreds of small towns. Uh, and we should guard their sustainability uh, and viability with great care. There are certain institutions in any town which make it viable. A school, a post office, a, a doctor's surgery, a police station and a bank. Uh, and so to lose the last bank in a community is a serious uh, matter. Indeed, it's a matter which the banks themselves understand because until recently, they had an agreement that wherever there was a branch in the uh, community, and it was the last one, whichever bank it was that ran that branch, they would not close it. That uh, agreement uh, has been simply uh, binned. And so it's because of the seriousness and the threat to the sustainability and viability of the community itself uh, that this closure has provoked such a reaction in the town of Preston Pans and the county of East Lothian. That's why the local Labour Party, Preston Pans Branch Labour Party, uh, have mounted a petition against the closure and have been out on the streets in front of the, the bank collecting signatures for some weeks now. It is also why the first signatory to that petition uh, was one Jimmy Yule, who is the chair of Preston Pans Community Council, who have also made clear uh, their concern at the closure uh, of the bank. Now, I, I understand that those institutions I listed in our communities, schools, post offices, uh, are uh, largely public sector or in part public, se public sector or once were public sector, whereas RBS is, of course, a commercial operation. And I cannot deny uh, the case that RBS make that fewer of their customers are using branches directly with more customers, banking online uh, and so on. But they must understand that does not mean that no one uses this bank branch. And in fact, uh, I have a, a, a number of experiences sent to me, uh, all in similar vein. Here's one. Uh, unbelievable experience in the bank this afternoon. Queues constant, average waiting time 20, 25 minutes. The reaction from the members of the public was amazing, with people constantly coming up and wishing us good luck with the campaign. A few old ladies were explaining to me that they don't have computers, so don't bank online. People opened the door and said, oh hell, the queues are out the door again, and left. So this is not uh, a branch uh, which has no customers uh, who use it. And those customers do not understand why they are now expected to go to uh, RBS branches in Trinent or Musselburgh because those are communities which are not easy to reach and communities which have several branches of different banks themselves. They also uh, are reluctant to trust RBS because they remember uh, branches close by in Port Seton and Long Nidri closed uh, many years ago and commitments that were made then about ATMs and alternative facilities which were not kept. Above all, this is a closure which will not suit uh, elderly uh, or disabled customers. One of those who signed my petition made that very clear when she said, on my petition, the Labour Party's petition, when uh, she said, my aunt is disabled and can't get any further than the Press and Pans branch. 
due to her disability and panic attacks when she gets on the bus to go further afield. This local branch is needed for the disabled and elderly. Another said, I work as a care worker with the elderly in Preston Pans. They are all so worried and stressed with the thought of the bank closing since receiving the letters last week. Their conversation is about uh, nothing else. This is a closure which does not suit small businesses either. A number of those who work in small shops in the high street in Preston Pans have expressed concern to me because part of their duty uh, when they close in the evening uh, is to take cash uh, to the, the drawer in the branch, which is just across the road, and deposit it there. They certainly don't want to be asked to get on a bus and travel to uh, another town altogether while carrying the day's takings. Curiously, though, it is also a closure which does not suit children. Uh, one signatory to the petition said to me, I use the bank regularly to pay in my account and also my four-year-old son who likes to go weekly and pay in his savings account book. He loves his weekly routine of banking for him and then lunch from the baker straight from the nursery, which he will miss if I have to travel to another branch. And this, of course, is the nub of it, because that four-year-old boy is RBS's customer of the future, and he is one of those uh, who is losing faith in that branch. And this is a bank who spend time, uh, often I think, trying to promote a very positive image. Uh, and another campaign I'm involved in uh, with Grace Warnock uh, of Grace's Sign, uh, RBS have been very supportive of that new sign for disabled toilets and have installed it in their own offices. But in the end, it is the way they treat their customers which matters. And these are customers of many years standing who are angry at this bank. And they are angry too, because they know that it is not so long ago that this bank looked to them as taxpayers to bail them out when they were on the point of collapse. And they promised then that they would return to doing the things which we expect our banks to do. And one of the things we expect them to do is to be there on our high street when we need them. And that is why RBS should change their mind about this decision. I now move to speeches of four minutes, please. And can I have Bruce Crawford, who will be followed by Rachel Hamilton. Yeah, thank you, President Officer. Can I begin, as is customary, by thanking Ian Gray for putting down this particular motion. I think Ian put across the position in regards to press and pans and the proposed closure of the bank there very effectively. And as you might imagine, the story that Ian's just told is a story that can be told in the small towns as Ian described them. And many parts of Scotland. Indeed, there are two banks due to close in my own constituency, um, one in Stirling and one in Callander. Now, it's, it's, a, it's not good that the one in Stirling is closing, but at least there's another Royal Bank of Scotland and other banks for people to choose. But as far as Callander is concerned, it could have a real impact on that and on Callander. I want to come back to that. But I think Ian quite rightly reflected on the fact that there's a reality out there about new technology, online banking, and of course more and more young people are, if I'm still classed as young, I certainly do my banking online. Um, I don't think I'm that chronologically challenged that I can't manage to achieve that still, but there are many who are, who are a generation older than I am who are not as able to access online banking. And I know that they've opened up potential for post offices to be involved in some of the banking for the older people, but that's not what older people want to see in their, their own high street. And he's right about the issue about small businesses, and particularly with the, the cash issue at night where they close their businesses. And there's a real security fear around some of the small businesses if they cannot disp the, properly um, have the cash that they've raised on that day taken care with effectively. So there are real issues there. Now, obviously this is about the bottom line of how the bank works and whether or not it can be a profitable organization following some of the real challenges it faced a, a number of years ago following the crash in 2008. But if I'm right, the shareholders in this um, particular bank are still majority held by, much of it by the government, and therefore the shareholders are actually the people themselves who are being affected by the closures, whether it's in Preston, Pan, Stirling or Calendar, that we've already described. 
And one of the things that I've certainly tried to stress to the Royal Bank of Scotland is there may be a bottom line issue. Yes, the market may be changing, but you've also got social responsibilities to, this, to the customers you've served over a long period of time. And these communities where you've been operating, you've been taking financial resources out of that and using them for profit in your own way. So you've got a bit of responsibility back the other way in these communities. And that's particularly true when it comes to the town of Callender. It's been a town in recent past that's had some challenges on its main street. Uh, and I spoke to the bank, tried to persuade them, first of all, please don't consider closing this particular branch because of the potential impact on Callender as it's be beginning to try to readdress its place in the marketplace. Um, I think that was probably a forlorn hope for mine, probably a forlorn hope for Ian, but I've asked them to consider extending the life of the bank, at least, until the, the Main Street and Calendar can potentially find a better outcome for itself. Now, there are, and Ian talked about other issues in the area of press and pans and what holds a community together. And if you take the bank closures along to, alongside issues like lack of connectivity in some small rural towns in Scotland or the fact that public transport's becoming more and more of a difficulty for people in these small rural towns throughout Scotland. A bank closure actually becomes a really significant issue in their lives. But I'm really delighted that Ian Gray's provided us with this opportunity today to be able to speak on this important matter. It's allowed us to highlight not only just press and pans, but I'm sure as others will do um, this evening, highlight the particular challenges in their own communities. And I thank you for that, President Officer, and I thank Ian Gray again. Rachel Hamilton to be followed by Jackie Bailey. RBS continue with their savage cuts, closing down more branches on our Scottish high streets, this time in Preston Pans. Only in banking could a company post a loss of two billion and hand out 370 million in bonuses to staff, then continue with its ruth ruthless foray of branch closures. Banks should think more about how their social responsibilities to the vulnerable stand and not about profit margins. I'm not sure if anyone remembers back in 2010 when RBS pledged never to close a branch if it was the last in town. So what's changed? They say that low footfall is to blame and a significant shift to digital services. A large proportion of residents in Preston Pans are pensioners and contrary to the belief of senior management in RBS, they are not all adept with an iPad. Over-the-counter banking should still be available to those for whom internet banking is not an option. Business customers are as equally important requiring daily banking services and change orders for which the bank charge handsomely. Competition from out-of-town centres is fierce and small shops and businesses require essential services to survive and compete. Sadly, a similar irretrievable pattern of closures emerged in the borders with Newtown St Boswell's recently shutting, shortly followed by Earlston. There's no mention on the RBS website about lunchtime closures at the Melrose branch, but they still religiously continue to inconveniently take a lunch break, perhaps covertly, but purposefully weaning its lo loyal customers from its services. I remember when my old man enjoyed a whiskey at the kitchen table on first name terms with his bank manager. He knew the business inside out. Banks have lost the plot, and I urge RBS to reconsider its proposals. Which brings me on to another contentious subject regarding East Lothian. Service, service supply issues are not just a problem associated with banking in East Lothian. More than 10,000 homes are expected to be built by 2024. Concerns have repeatedly been raised by communities over the impact additional housing will have on the country's infrastru county's infrastructure. Fears that schools and doctor surgeries will be unable to cope, as well as the potential of thousands more vehicles on the roads and overcrowding on the trains, topped by the ongoing closure of the high street banks, is not acceptable. I would hope that the Scottish Government will set out their plans on how best to deliver this growth. It is important that residents of East Lothian receive the best possible deal on infrastructure and the implementation implementation of a strategy which best mitigates the impact of this population growth. There is an underlying assumption that the A1 and East Coast mainline can accommodate this growth. This is untrue. Both are already at capacity. 
Our local train services are full before they even reach Wallyford, with car parks overflowing. Abellio have said it will be years until they increase capacity to meet, meet current demand. So how can we have any confidence that they will be able to meet this demand? Peak time rail services between Edinburgh and North Berwick are woefully overcrowded and we are still waiting for the long overdue reopening of East Linton and Reston stations and the duelling of the A1 trunk road to the English border. The pressures on East Lothian continue. Many res residents require a car to travel beyond Edinburgh, yet the trunk road network is already grinding to a halt and that's before the massive, cumulative, predicted growth of Mid Lothian and Edinburgh. Old Craig Hall, Sheriff Hall, the city bypass and beyond all need massive amounts of investment and forward planning. Yet to date, nothing has been done to address this. I end by saying to Transport Scotland and Scottish Government, do not fail East Lothian like Can RBS you wind are. Up, please? I urge them to outline how they're going to address the infrastructure issues and I ask Royal Bank of Scotland to, to reconsider their closure. Uh, before I call Ms Bailey, can I remind members that members' business should address the motion in hand and that the Minister will only respond to the motion in hand. Ms Bailey to be followed by Bob Doris. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. And like others, can I thank Ian Gray um, for securing this debate because it's very clear that a number of local communities um, are affected by the latest round of closure announcements by RBS. Um, many of us will remember the television adverts that boast about Royal Bank of Scotland's commitment to local communities. You know, forgive me for feeling just slightly bitter about that and wondering whether it breaches the Trades Description Act, because that's clearly not the case. August seems to be the designated month for when these closures will happen. Like Preston Pans and indeed Callender and Stirling, the impact on my local community is centred in Alexandria. The proposal there is, of course, to utilise the post office and ATMs, or indeed if people want face-to-face -face consultations, they need to travel four miles away to Dumbarton. I think, however accessible the bank attempts to make some of its alternative solutions, the reality is this is about our towns and our town centres. And I state for the record that the Alexandria branch, every time I've been in it, has been enormously busy. There is, of course, a UK government protocol on branch closures, which all the banks signed up to last year. It commits them to finding suitable alternative provision for individual communities, to put in place alternative banking services um, where a branch is closed. And I accept that they have tried to do this, but it's not adequate. But it's the principal provision where they have to work with local communities to establish the impact of the branch closure prior to its closure. In my view, this has not been done. They've not been consulted in advance. The bank announced the closure of the branch and then said, we'll talk to you about it. That's not consultation in my book. That's a fait accompli. And I don't think that's in the spirit of what was intended by the protocol. Local people have rightly been concerned. And let me just share with you two comments. Somebody said, I've been a customer at the RBS Alexandria branch for over 10 years, and I doubt I'll ever switch to online banking because I don't even use cash line machines. I will introduce them to colleagues in the chamber after for instruction. Somebody else said, I've banked there since I was a child, and if it closes, I will be moving to another bank. It's not always suitable to go to Dumbarton. No consultation with clients, just a letter yesterday saying it was closing and will be kept informed. But you know, this is so short-sighted because there are regeneration plans for Alexandria Town Centre, some £6.5 million pumped into that local high street in Mitchell Way where the bank branch is situated. And I simply note that the council has already invested just shy of a million pounds to improve signage, which included improvements to RBS premises. Presiding officer, the one thing that I know that makes me absolutely convinced that this is the wrong thing to do isn't just the regeneration plans that, that are in place for that town centre, but the fact that RBS's actions have managed to unite both the Labour group and the SNP group on Western Bartonshire Council, something that doesn't happen too often, but they have come together to urge RBS to think again. 
and I think they're absolutely right to do so. Thank you, Ms Bailey. May I say well done? You don't sound very well. Uh, now move to Bob Dorris to be followed by Rhoda Grant. Uh, thank you very much, President Officer. And can I start off, as others have done, in thanking Ian Gray for placing his motion before Parliament and making it available for members' debate this afternoon, giving MSPs from right across Scotland the opportunity to put on the record our deep concerns about local RBS branch closures affecting our constituency. Our constituencies across Scotland. In Maryhill and Springburn, there are two branches set for closure in Postle Park on the 9th of August and in Maryhill on the 17th of August. Um, I recently met with RBS officials asking them to uh, review that decision, to halt those decisions, and I'll say more about that in a second. But at that meeting, there were representatives from Maryhill and Somerset Community Council, from Postle Park Community Council, from Park House Community Council, Lamb Hill Community Council, from NG Homes representing the social housing movement within the constituency, some of our councillors and Patrick Grady, MP and apologies from many more, giving you the whole range of, of, of individuals and citizens concerned about, about the closures. Now, RBS have put on record their low usage numbers, but when I met with them, when we met with them to discuss this, I said um, to them, do you know how many people in the area actually have bank accounts in the first place? They didn't have that information. I don't know if they knew that before they made their decision. I asked them if they knew how many people were actually connected to the internet in the first place. They didn't have that information. They didn't do the very basics to identify the impact, not just of those currently using RBS in Postle Park in Maryhill, but I'm just as concerned, if not more concerned, in areas of like Postle Park, for example, where people don't have bank accounts in the first place, and has RBS been the only bank in town there, the only hope they have of access to mainstream financial services is the RBS. Now RBS wish to take that away from them. It actually directly contradicts their own corporate and social responsibilities, because RBS actually talk about uh, people finding themselves at risk of financial exclusion, being unable to access the basic financial services, the need for day-to-day -day living. One risk is that people can end up borrowing from payday loan companies or doorstep lenders, which pushes them even further into difficulty as they struggle to pay back high interest charges. That's from their own corporate and social responsibility document. I asked them, do they know the levels of indebtedness in these areas? Do they know how many people uh, seek alternative lending arrangements such as payday lenders? They didn't have that most basic information. Their decision was made on a basic business model, irrespective of the corporate and social consequences. And now their consultation, as Jackie Bailey outlined, is about mitigating the worst effects of that. Uh, so that was deeply, deeply worrying. Um, other organisations also contacted me. I'd like to put some of their concerns on the record as well. Uh, Rockhill Credit Union gave me a, a very detailed submission on why it will directly impact on their organisation for for uh, time constraints, I won't read through that. And a local church leader as well spoke about how it will devastate the local community also. I have to say, we actually did have a pretty constructive meeting, believe it or not, after all that, uh, in Postle Park in relation to trying to save the, the branches. We thought about uh, some alternative thinking about co-location of the branches with uh, other organisations. We actually met in a, in a brand new building that NG Homes are an anchor tenant and is run by Jobs and Business Glasgow. They have capacity to co-locate an RBS branch in there if they had that blue sky thinking. They said they would consider alternative co-location options in both Maryhill and in Postle Park and other suggestions that we were keen to make. The thing is, they can't possibly consider them by the 9th of August for Postle Park, and they can't possibly consider them by the 17th of August for Mary Hill. And we insisted in continuity of banking services across the constituency. And RBS have pledged to go away and consider whether or not they will give a stay of execution to Postle Park and to Mary Hill on the basis that we are coming with alternative solutions. The consultation was flawed, but the meeting was positive, and RBS will be listening tonight. I know they will, they will not just in Postle Park and in Mary Hill, but can we give all our communities a stay of execution, go back to the drawing board, and to think again, and hope that's something the Minister will back here this afternoon. Roger Grant to be followed by Neil Finlay. Um, thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I congratulate Dean Gray on securing the debate as well? Um, I understand it's a big problem for his constituents in Preston Pans, and I share 
his concerns uh, with, some, with regard to similar action by RBS causing problems for my own constituents throughout the Highlands and Islands. Most recently in Campbellton, Beaumont and Scaranish, the branches were having their opening hours reduced. Now, the two island branches um, are only open two days a week. So therefore, to access an alternative branch, it involves a ferry journey out with their opening hours. The people in Campbelltown and indeed Preston Plans, albeit not in islands, can't easily access an alternative branch either. Uh, these service reductions from RBS follow closures in branches last year in the Highlands and Islands in Inver, <coughs> Stromness, Inver Gordon and Livester. However, it's not just a problem with RBS because many of the other high street branches are doing exactly the same and following suit, such as the Bank of Scotland <coughs> closing branches in remote areas. And it's simply wrong um, that these banks are taking a wholly business-focused approach, ignoring the needs of their customers. And these same customers are the very taxpayers that bailed out these banks not so long ago. It's simply wrong that they now ignore their duty to repay that by cutting services rather than with a debt of gratitude. They cite internet banking as the reason for the reductions in services and they tell, because they tell us there's reduced footfall. And in my area, this is adding insult to injury, the places that they're targeting for these service cuts and closures are the places where internet access is patchy at the very best. So faced by an unreliable internet service, non-existent branch banking, these areas are not getting any banking services at all. Add to that the needs of elderly people, they're less likely to bank online, and they're more open to fraudulent scams, either by phone banking or indeed emails from their own banks. And therefore, th these are the most vulnerable in our communities and their needs are being ignored. If we're going to help protect them, they need to have access to information and services uh, from, from branches of their local banks. And we maybe need to look also at credit unions, how we support them to open branches in those small communities to allow elderly people and people who don't bank on the internet and indeed people who don't have bank accounts to access financial services because it seems to me that banks have given up this role in the community altogether and we need to look alter at alternatives um, of how to provide that to people. Presiding officer, banks have a duty to their customers, the customers that bailed them out and it's time for government to act and intervene on behalf of those customers to try and stop those closures. At the last of the open speeches, Neil Finlay. Uh, thanks, uh, Deputy President Officer. The Royal Bank and the banking sector in general is going through a mass evacuation from its branch network. Across the country, there appears to be a cull of branches uh, going on, and, and that cull is very clear evidence of a complete failure of planning and an absence of managerial competence. On the one hand, we have a marketing strategy aimed at moving people away from branches and onto telephone and internet banking because as well as it being promoted as convenient for the customer, it also cuts costs. And on the other hand, we have a policy that when it was launched, stated we pledged to stay open for business if we are the last bank in town. Well, since that policy was announced, we have witnessed bank after bank close 600 since 2010, and many of these are the last bank in town. How on earth can senior banking executives have got it so spectacularly wrong? Is it not obvious that if you drive a policy that leads people away from banking in person to one where we use, you use technology and rely on technology, it will inevitably run down the branch network? Promoting a last bank in town policy at the same time was either complete incompetence or a policy that deliberately sought to mislead customers and the public. And RBS have never declared which of these is the case. In my region, many branches have closed, such as Falthouse, Armadale, South Gale, Tollcross, Royal Infirmary, Northbridge, Balerno, Golden Acre, Newton Grange, and more are planned at West Calder, Broxburn, Fairmailhead, Collington, and Harriet Watt, and indeed there may be uh, more. This is a bank that we control with a 73% stake. I do not, as a shareholder in that bank, give my authority to close those banks. And I hope none of us do, because we are indeed the shareholders. And maybe the Conservative 
uh, members or member who's here could have a word with the Chancellor because he's got a bit of influence over what goes on in this situation. This is a bank we had to bail out where successive corporate failure has been rewarded. 17.4 million awarded in shares to 10 of the senior management team. The chief executive on a salary of 3.8 million and 2.6 million worth of shares. And all the time, public sector or indeed banking staff are lucky to get 1%. Reinforcing that view that there's one law for a certain group of people and another law for the rest. Um, President officer, uh, this closure programme has, is, is just another example of RBS's failings. There's been no discussion with loyal customers, no consultation, just corporate diktat, diktat from the boardroom. But they could do one thing uh, in this to try and uh, get their way out of things or try and gain some credibility with those communities. Of course, they could stop the closures or at least, at least some of the closures, but they could also think about how they could give something back to the communities that have, they have profited from over the years. Where there is a desire to, and where it is practical to do so, they could transfer the asset to the community. They could transfer the building to the community. That would at least go some way to doing something to re reward those loyal communities. I have asked for that in my area, and they have refused. The bank, despite closing over Around, or around 18 months ago, still lies vacant. Um, I think that uh, this has been a, a, just another evidence of poor management uh, by I, I, I RBS, and I think the members of the public uh, deserve much better. Bob Doris said in his contribution that RBS didn't have the basic information on the numbers of people with bank accounts, on the number of people who had IT access. They don't have it because they don't care. They don't want to have it. They have a programme of closure and they're going to ram through this closure come what may. That is the reality of it. Uh, I have requested a similar meeting uh, as he has. Unfortunately, I'm still waiting on a reply. I now call Paul Wheelhouse to wind up the debate. You have seven minutes, Minister. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer, and I want to thank Ian Gray uh, for raising today's motion. If I, if I may, I'm not sure if I've uh, congratulated the uh, Deputy Presiding Officer, uh, Linda Fabiani, on her, her appointment uh, since I, uh, I've returned, so uh, I do that now. Uh, but I do thank Ian Gray for bringing this motion before Parliament today. I think it's an extremely important issue, uh, and the issue of bank uh, branch closures is one that this Parliament has debated before. Uh, and I appreciate the members have raised genuine concerns as Royal Bank of Scotland and other banks uh, continue to close branches, not only in Mr Gray's constituency in East Lothian, uh, but across Scotland, as we've heard. And indeed, uh, trying to do a rough tally, and, and uh, apologies, this may not be accurate, but I think in the current year, we have nine closures from Clydesdale Bank, uh, 13 from Bank of Scotland, eight from TSB, and 13 from Royal Bank of Scotland. So that gives a sense of scale as to the change that is happening at a local level. I, I am aware of a number of uh, closures in, in both East Lothian and Scottish borders, um, and including loss of historic branch in my own village, Ayton, which, uh, which was uh, hard felt locally. But concerns have been raised uh, again today about the impact of branch closures on our local communities, and some very important points have been made by members, many highlighting branches um, that uh, across the chamber have actually appeared to be busy when they've gone into them in recent times. Uh, so it's sometimes difficult for us to understand the, the business driver for closure of banks, uh, but I'll come on to that later. Uh, banks have an essential role clearly in Scottish society and members across the chamber have recognised that, but they are particularly important in our local economies. We all rely on banks in order to conduct our daily lives. The Scottish Government is absolutely clear that customers must be at the heart of what the banks do and the decisions they make. And Ian Gray made a very important point about the Preston, Pan, uh, Preston Pans branch being the very last one in the town. I think that's the particular significance in, in, the, in that particular community, but clearly that is also being experienced around, around the country. The decision taken by RBS to close these branches will have an effect on everyone in the local community, not least on the staff employed at these branches, and let's not forget that. Uh, staff who have often for many years provided a much valued service to their customers and, and Ian Gray hit on the, the kind of sense that there was a very much valued branch in Preston Pans itself. 
Um, I am uh, not liberty to give details out, but I do understand there's uh, no plans for compulsory redundancy. So that is at least something that's positive uh, to take from the discussion. But as Ian Gray identifies, there are commercial drivers, and we all accept that banks must address their long-term financial sustainability. RBS in particular is undertaking a process of restructuring uh, to bring the bank back to, back to profitability and ultimately to take the bank out of public sector ownership. But in doing so, RBS have made clear that cost savings have to be made and unfortunately difficult decisions must be made. We do understand that. However, it is clear from today's debate and from our previous debates that members do not feel that RBS gives sufficient weight to the views of customers and the wider community in deciding to close a branch. And as Jackie Bailey has highlighted, there are concerns as to the engagement with local communities in communities like Alexandria. And Alexandria clearly is a, is a community that um, uh, could ill afford to lose uh, vital employment at this stage as well. So the closure of a branch should be seen as a last resort and should only occur where customers, both personal and business, um, will still have ready access to the banking services they need. And Rhoda Grant set out in some detail where they would impact in rural areas, and I think that was an important perspective. Where a decision is made to close a branch, there is a three-month period between announcing a closure and the closure itself. And this has been agreed by the banks, by consumer bodies and by the UK government and set out in a branch closure uh, protocol. RBS and other banks are clear that this 12-week period is a notice period, not a consultation period. However, this time can and should be used for genuine engagement with customers. Alternative arrangements should clearly be explained and any particular difficulties uh, resolved where possible. And there appears, as members have highlighted, to be no opportunity for customers and communities to influence the bank's decision. And when a closure is announced, the decision has effectively already been made. It is, as Jackie Bailey put it, a fait accompli. Uh, and that is a matter of great regret, I think, to us all. As Mr Gray highlighted in his motion, there's no doubt that many bank customers are increasingly using alternative methods to access banking services. RBS reports, for example, that uh, branch transactions have declined by 40% since 2010. And whilst online and mobile transactions have grown uh, by more than 400% in that same period, Bruce Crawford, I think, talked very effectively about the impact on older customers uh, of uh, perhaps this over-reliance we have in looking at branch closures on online banking as the solution. RBS notes that only 9% of their total transactions are now branch-based down from 25% in 2010. But clearly, when people seek to go into a branch, they're often wanting face-to-face -face, uh, contact because they maybe have a more complex uh, issue they need to resolve. Uh, and indeed, that may be very important for them to seek advice and support at maybe a time of distress. So as internet banking and increasingly mobile banking continues to grow in popularity, there is an inevitable impact on the number of customers who actively use a local physical branch. But such solutions do not and cannot suit all customers. Not everyone has easy access to an internet or mobile banking. That was a point that was made by Rhoda Grant and others. Face-to-face uh, -face banking is, is still considered essential by many customers. And a physical branch presence uh, will continue to be a requirement for many years to come. Banks must therefore consider access to suitable alternative service provision in any decisions they make about the delivery of branch services. And as members have highlighted, disabled and elderly customers will be disproportionately affected. Small businesses, cash generative uh, businesses, uh, including hospitality and other areas, me, me actually, uh, and, and Rachel Hamilton will, uh, will if, uh, if I may. Certainly. Neil Finlay. Do you agree with me that it, it's absurd to pursue a policy of moving people onto the telephone and internet banking at the same time as offering as promoting the last bank in town policy. That just to me is absolutely crazy. Paul well, it, it's, it's not for me to, to, to criticise the decisions about how banks go about their business in terms of promoting telephone uh, banking or, or, uh, or online banking, but I would agree with the member that it's very important that they, they understand the impact of a branch closure on customers who cannot take advantage of telephone banking or cannot take it. They may not have a telephone for a start, but those who are not access to the internet. So I think the, the impact on those who are, are disadvantaged in digital sense is absolutely essential to take that on board. And I, I did listen with, with great attention to what Bob Doris was saying on this point, but I'll, I'll give way to Mr Doris. <laughs> Bob uh, thank, Doris. Thank you. You, you may actually an answer the question there, Minister, but you talked about a modal shift away from high street banking for areas like Postal Park with significant deprivation. They've never made the modal shift from financially excluded to financially included. And if the bricks and mortar bank is no longer on the high street, we're writing that area off for generations to come. Do you think RBS should think about that before deciding to close a branch also? Uh, Paul Wheelhouse, we do have some time in hand. Oh, thank you, Presiding Officer. I, I do believe that's a very, very important point. I was going to return to that. I think Mr Doris, in his, his speech, uh, made some very important points about his own constituency, and I, I commend him for the action he's taken in engaging 
with uh, RBS to discuss the impact in his local community. He is quite right. We, we face a big challenge in Scotland getting many people access to banking services full stop. That has obviously not helped if the only local branches that they may be physically able to access are being closed at this time. And uh, the banks perhaps are missing an opportunity, perhaps the customers that they, they would be gaining are not necessarily ones that would be high net worth individuals, but they are potentially customers that could be of value to the business going forward. And I do regret that that, that does not appear to have played more of a part in their decision making process. But um, I think it was Bruce Crawford that was talking about uh, cash uh, generative businesses. Apologies to other members who may have mentioned that as well. But I do think that was a very important point. Uh, whether it's a local farmer or a local hospitality business, certainly in an area uh, such as uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Crawford's constituency, where many tourism businesses are taking a lot of cash on a day-to-day -day basis, they do need somewhere where they can safely deposit that cash and know it's been, uh, been uh, deposited as, as it's needed. But RBS is uh, maintaining it's continuing to invest in its mobile van branches. These are providing services in many areas where local branches have closed, as well as visiting communities that previously had no branch presence. However, this is very much a supply-led approach, and it's not necessarily as flexible for consumers as, as a physical branch, because obviously you can choose the time at which you decide to appear at the branch, not necessarily the time at which the, the branch is available to you. But however, I do, I do welcome the increased use of post offices as an alternative location for ban banking transactions, although clearly that network has also contracted in recent years and seen major changes, so it's not necessarily uh, in a particularly uh, stable place yet either. But there are, of course, other providers of financial services in Scotland. The Scottish Government has long recognised the valuable contribution made by credit unions. I was just going to touch on credit unions, but I'll give way to Mr Doris. It's just, oh, you, okay then. It's just, <laughs> Minister, you mentioned uh, post office as an alternative, but at a post office you can't open a bank account, you can't set up a direct debit, a standing order, alter either of them, get loans advice, get mortgage advice. Post offices just don't cut it, really, do they? Um, uh, <laughs> Minister, uh, can you wind up fairly quickly? I, I, I will, Presiding Officer. I, I, I don't want to criticise Post Office Network. I, I merely make the point that uh, as, as a uh, fall back in the absence of a local branch, it at least does improve the access for people to be able to obtain the funds. But I take Mr Doris's point on board about uh, the services that are provided. But there are, uh, as I say, of course, other providers, including credit unions, who do tackle financial exclusion of the kind that Mr Doris mentioned. And I was pleased to see him make reference to credit unions in his speech. They do provide vital financial services to a wide range of customers. Uh, but as I say, I was very struck by his own intervention in, in relation to his own local branch, and I wish him success in that campaign. But, presiding officer, I do appreciate members' concerns about the impact of these closures on our communities, uh, whether it's the borders, as uh, Rachel Hamilton said, or East Lothian, and uh, as Mr Gray said, and all across the country. I do appreciate members' concerns. In my new ministerial role, I will have the opportunity to meet regularly with representatives from the banks, and I certainly undertake uh, that I will uh, raise these issues uh, when I have opportunities to do so with, uh, with the branch to make sure that the banks are aware of the strength of feeling across the chamber today. I urge RBS, uh, which Bruce Crawford, Ian Gray, uh, Neil Finn also pointed out, which is 71% publicly owned by the taxpayer, uh, to listen to and work with local communities and their representatives in ensuring that banking services remain readily accessible to all uh, and meet the needs of Scottish communities, and to work to ensure that uh, it does not do harm to the common good in closing bank branches in remote and vulnerable communities. And I hope that a positive outcome can come from discussions that Mr Doris will have with RBS regarding his own constituency. Indeed, if Mr Finlay is given an appointment, that there may be opportunities to look at alternative models and the government will be supported where we can be of those. Thank you very much for your patience, <laughs> Presiding Officer. Thank you, Minister. I now close this meeting of Parliament.